Greetings, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me on this R. Kelly Appeal TV uh, continuance of the review of Solace, the case against R. Kelly by Jim Dare Goddess. And we're going to move into the Aaliyah agreement, and um, we're going to read a little more of that. I am so grateful to those commenters and subscribers who are really, really digging deep and find, soul searching some of this soulless book regarding um, R. Kelly. We're doing him a serious justice here because I believe that these were the reasons that created the fiasco to what we now know as the docuseries of um, Lifetime. So we're going to get right on into the book, critique it a little more. This section I will actually be reading because I believe that it is important. Okay, in, in the agreement, and it was a separation agreement, Kelly admitted no liability of wrongdoing and Aaliyah and her parents disregarded him from any future legal claims due to a decline in her ability, reputation, or marketability. Emotional distress caused by any aspect of her business or personal relationship with Robert or physical injury or emotional pain and suffering from any assault or battery perpetrated by Robert against her person. Hankerson and an attorney for Kelly, Arnold E. Reed, were named as monitors to assure that the two comply with the terms of the agreement. When Abden and I reviewed these pages with Don Hayner, the law school grad turned city editor. He thought the assault and battery clause would be boilerplate for any divorce agreement. Why did why did not note we did not note it in our story? Only years later did the possible significance strike me after other women began telling me Kelly allegedly, allegedly physically assaulted them if they broke his rules. Unlike many, we worked with him. Aaliyah's career thrived after she split with Kelly. She left Jive, the label founded by Clive Calder and signed with Virgin Records. In 1994, Hankerson and the Hoftons came to Calder's office. Um, on the Washington Post reported uh, a quarter century later. There was no talk of reprimanding Kelly. Instead, the family demanded that Jive let Aaliyah go. And they basically tell me that they want a release from the contract. Calder said, saying that they thought Aaliyah would never get the proper promotion if she was on the same label as Kelly. Calder agreed to let her leave, but only after securing a percentage of her future album sales on a new album. So again, I believe that this agreement was more or less about her royalties and her going out on her own label than it possibly was about uh, a marriage or anything like that. But we'll keep reading. Aaliyah released her second album, One in a Million on Virgin in 1996, August. A radical departure from the slick R&B sounds Kelly crafted for her debut. Many of her new grooves were written and produced by then um, rising hip hop talents, Missy Elliott and Timbaland. With them, Aaliyah helped invent a style that might be called avant-garde R&B. Um, the collaboration between Kelly and Aaliyah became history. Whenever R. Kelly comes up, a virgin executive told me she doesn't even speak his name. When she came over to this label, we were all told on the sly, don't ever bring up R. Kelly's name. It's just one of those weird topics. One in a Million eventually sold more than 3 million copies in the U.S. and Aaliyah also starred a film, started a film career. In March 2000, she co-starred in Romeo Must Die, a streetwise retelling of Shakespeare's tragic love story. She played the daughter of a gangster in love with Kung Fu master Jet Li, an ex-cop investigating the murder of his brother, a member of the Chinese mob. The affair was, of course, star-crossed. Everyone I interviewed said the affection between Kelly and Aaliyah had been genuine. He loved Aaliyah, Demetrius said, Smith said, while he and others described her feelings for Kelly as a teenage crush turned to infatuation. 
Young, naive, and sheltered by her family, Aaliyah experienced independence for the first time while working on AJ Number but a Number. All but one of my sources said she and Kelly began having sexual contact during her first recording sessions. Some said he surprised her with the marriage ceremony in a third floor room at the Sheraton Gateway Suites in suburban Rosemont and that Aaliyah looked nervous and scared. She thought it was all an elaborate game, one source said. Another claim she knew she regretted. Her family wasn't there, but she just got swept up in the excitement. Okay, so if this was a teenage crush and Aaliyah was not taking any of this seriously, how did she get caught up in a in all of the hoopla of it and all of the excitement? Demetrius Smith gave me the most detailed account, later repeated in his book, The Man Behind the Man. After a gig in Orlando while on tour with Salt and Pepper, Kelly told Smith they had to return to Chicago immediately before the next show in Miami because Aaliyah had run away from home and needed to see him. When they got back to Chicago, Aaliyah told Kelly she was pregnant. Kelly's account, Daryl McDavid and attorney Margolis, convinced him he should marry his protege, Smith claimed. Neither of them would comment. Smith, Kelly, and Aaliyah obtained the Cook County marriage certificate at a city hall in suburban Maywood using fake IDs Smith bought for Aaliyah in what he called Jewtown slang for Chicago's famous Maxwell Street Market, which starred as a Jewish ghetto but became a hotbed of electric blues and a thriving bazaar where black vendors sold everything from discount colored TVs to stereos to bootleg CDs and videos. Aaliyah lied about her age, signing the marriage certificate as an 18-year-old. She admitted in the court documents, Abden and I obtained. Several other sources confirmed that she told Kelly she was pregnant, but the legal findings made no mention of it. Mm. After the wedding, Smith and Kelly flew back to Florida while Aaliyah stayed at the hotel in Rosemont. But Smith said that within a day, she left and went home to Detroit, telling her parents and Uncle Barry Hankerson what had happened. Aaliyah was a baby. She knew nothing. Aaliyah was just a sweet child. Smith said others disagreed and said some members of her family knew about the relationship. What is confirmed in the legal documents is that the family immediately set about undoing the marriage and keeping it quiet so that no damage would come to her career. We never had any trouble with Aaliyah when that was done. A family member told me it was never her trying to see him, call him, or get to him. We didn't want any money. The issue with the family was to move on and totally undo what R. Kelly did. We just thought this guy is stupid. He's like a big, dumb 15-year-old himself. At that time, we didn't think about pedophilia. It was just, how dumb can you be, boy? You're lucky we are the family. We embraced her and she cried and she said she never wanted to see him again. We were apprehensive and we watched her, but we never took away the freedom of the telephone or the mobility to leave the house. She just never saw him again. Smith agreed. Rob made a mistake. That's how the family looked at it. Although Hankerson stayed on as Kelly's manager, Barry just started backing up after that. He was trying to save his family and his career. Barry is a smart man and he's compassionate and a good man who realizes that we are all born to sin. The relationship between Kelly and Hankerson was never the same. However, McDavid began to play a bigger role in overseeing the singer's career long before Hankerson quit in early 2000. Instead of Clores and Associates in 2000, Kelly employed as his public uh, publicist, Regina Daniels, the wife of the owner of the Southside's biggest recording re record store, George's Music Room, which boasted a wall-sized mural of Kelly. Midway through our reporting, I called Daniels to ask her about Kelly and Aaliyah. She gave me a statement that exceeded what anyone in Kelly's camp had been authorized to say, and sources told me her employers later chided her for it. Rob did date Aaliyah. Yes, he did. And he did have a relationship with Aaliyah. Yes, he did. In the past, that unfortunately, it didn't work out, and that was really bad. Did they have a relationship? Yeah, they did. 
I'm not going to sit here and bullshit you or nobody else about it. Yes, they did. Did they get married? Well, there was a marriage certificate. So that pretty much kind of means something happened there. Was I there? No, I wasn't. But there was a relationship. It ended with maybe we're over our heads. Maybe this is too much. Maybe we need to go our separate ways. I love you. I always will. I wish you the best. And maybe we just jumped in way too deep into this thing. And she went her way and he went his. Daniel's chastised me for even asking about the relationship. Robert has done any done enough else in his career that if people can't say nothing else other than whether or not he screwed Aaliyah, then they kiss then they can kiss my ass. Her tone made it clear she meant it. According to Smith, the sudden end of relationship with Aaliyah crushed him. <clears throat> the singer finished his tour, returned to Chicago, and checked into Hotel Nico, where he spent more than a month sleeping in the closet. Whenever Kelly got depressed, Smith said he tried to tell his friend to sing Hard Times, the song he had written as a teen about his mom in the early days. When Kelly finally emerged, he wrote a new song called Trade In My Life that eventually appeared on the R. Kelly album in November 1995 with backing from a gospel choir led by Kirk Franklin. We both knew that we made a vow, said we'd always be together. That other love would endure, yes, but now you're gone and I'm all alone, Kelly croons. The song ends with him posing the same question the heavenly voice asked a few years later in the I Wish video. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? As Apton and I continued reporting, we secured police and court records and found that by late 2000, R. Kelly had three brushes with the law. The first only nine days after he married Aaliyah on September 9th, 1994, at the end of his tour with salt and pepper he headlined the Bud Budweiser Superfest at Madison Square Garden. The singer and his crew stayed at a plush, a plush Michael Angelo Hotel near Times Square, and the day after the show, police arrested two of his bodyguards in the hotel room on charges of raping and sodomizing a 22-year-old woman. The hotel's guest services agent confirmed that a rape had been reported, according to New York Newsday, which added that police sought a third suspect. We would find no resolution of the case, but sources told me the incident actually involved Kelly and an underage girl with a fake ID who later withdrew her charges when the star paid her cash settlement. Kelly posted bond for the bodyguards after they spent a night on Rutgers Island, tour manager Demetrius Smith said the pair had rushed to Kelly's room as a girl fled and they stayed to talk to the police why Kelly left the hotel. He paid them, but then treated them like shit. They took that case for him, but after that, he had no respect for them. In the summer of 96, Kelly himself was arrested along with four of his bodyguards after they got into a fight with some local players on the basketball court at a health club in Lafayette, Louisiana. Hours before a scheduled performance at the Conjundome, Cajodome, one of the three men who pressed charges had been beaten so badly he needed 110 stitches on his face, according to police. They charged Kelly with second degree battery, a felony punishable by up to five years in prison. And he spent the district attorney in Lafayette eventually determined that Kelly had no not started the fight and he reduced the charges to simple battery. The singer drew a sentence of one year of unsupervised probation and he ended a civil claim by the men with a cash settlement. Finally, one night in the spring of 1998, Chicago police arrested Kelly for disorderly conduct as he sat in his new Lincoln Navigator blasting loud music outside the Rock and Roll McDonald's on North Clark, Clark Street. According to a report in the Sun-Times, police said Kelly became loud and abusive when officers asked him to turn down the music. A city ordinance prohibited music so loud it could be heard 75 feet from the vehicle. As a crowd gathered to watch, Kelly refused to produce a driver's license and offered and officers arrested him. He went limp as they carried him to their squad car. 
Chicago's black radio stations harshly criticized police for harassing the hometown hero and overacting by seizing his SUV. A CPD postman noted that 4,764 vehicles had been impounded under the ordinance the previous year, and Kelly had been treated no different than any other offender. The singer did seem to get special treatment in court, however, which later struck Abden as unusual. In July 1998, at a hearing that lasted less than a minute, the city dropped its charges. Kelly's fans applauded, but law enforcement sources told Abden and me the arrest had never been only about the noise. Cops on the beat near rock and roll music knew the youth division of the Special Investigations Unit was looking at Kelly for sexual encounters with underage girls, and they believed he cruised for teens at the, gar the garish theme restaurant. Kelly also frequented Evergreen Plaza shopping mall on the south side, and he loved when girls recognized him there. We go to the shopping mall in every city we visited, Demetrius Smith said. Chicago cops told Abden and me they kept an eye out for Kelly at Evergreen Plaza, too. A few weeks later, before the facts prompted me to check the Leonard notes for TP2Com, I don't I hadn't realized Kelly had a family. His second wedding, midway between the first with Aaliyah in 94 and the settlement with Tiffany in 1998, never garnered any mention in the press, although we couldn't even find the date of the wedding. Abton and I learned to, in public record searches, that in 1996, Kelly married 22-year-old Andrea Lee, a dancer from his touring troupe. Sources said they met when she was 19. They had two children, Jaya, born earlier that year, and Joanne, born in 1998, named after Kelly's mother. He married Andrea to take the attention off of Aaliyah, but he never talks about her, Smith said. Kelly never stopped pursuing other girls, and sources led me to one whose relationship ended a little more than a year before I got the facts, three years after Kelly married Andrea. A Los Angeles girl told me the first, uh, the singer first tried to seduce her when she visited the set for the video, If I Could Turn Back the Hands of Time, in the spring of 99. She was a 17-year-old high school senior when one of Kelly's assistants pressed a tiny, bold a piece of paper with a phone number on it in her hand. From there, we just started talking over the phone. She told him her age. I don't believe in lying, but he was trying to woo me out there to Chicago despite the fact. Once I brought up the whole thing of, well, I have to ask my mother, he was like, you told your mom? Well, just wait then. The Los Angeles girl told me she continued talking to Kelly and when they engaged in phone sex, he said they were soulmates. She believed he loved her and after he sent her a plane ticket to visit Chicago on her 18th birthday, she had sex with him for the first time in August 99. He never told her he was married, and they started fighting as soon as she found out. I do believe he does have a problem, she said. I look back at it now, and I think I was stupid. Why the hell did I even go out there at all? There are some couples that there is a big diff age difference, but in this situation, I think he really does have some kind of sexual problem. He was like, you need to act older. There's 15-year-old girls who act like they're 21 years old. Three weeks into our reporting, Abden and I felt we had enough for a story. But as we sat in Don Hayner's office reviewing everything we'd learned about our Kelly and underage girls, the city editor pointed out that all the relationships we could document had taken place in the past. What about the present? Right now, the facts had said. He's messing with the 13-year-old girl who he tells people is his goddaughter. Robert hired her father, who was a bass player. Several sources confirmed that the prominent thanks in the liner notes of TP2.com for my goddaughter, Roshana, Greg, and Valerie. Refer to Roshana Landfair and her parents, who lived in the village of Oak Park, just west of Chicago. Rashana had recently enrolled at Oak Park and River Forest High School, and four sources told us her sexual contact with Kelly was ongoing. She was now 14. We also learned Kelly was allegedly having sexual contact with another girl a year younger, 13, from the southwest suburbs, with whom Rashana was close. 
Abden and I found the second girl's eighth grade school photo. We failed to connect with her family or the land fairs the many times we called, but we made one last determined push for our story in the Sun Times. We had learned a lot about the second girl's family, which had a high profile in the black community. Unusual for the girls Kelly seemed to pursue. We visit this McMansion newly excuse me, newly constructed at a cost of $830,000. The first two times we didn't get past the gated entry at the end of a long driveway. On our last trip, the gate was open. We parked in a circle in front of the house and rang the doorbell. But when the father's when the girl's father opened the door, he threatened to kick our asses if we didn't leave immediately, an attitude that seemed distinctly at odds with the genteel setting and his profession. It was so far the nastiest reception we got. The girl's name has never been published and never sh- and neither she nor her family members have ever spoken publicly about Kelly like most newspapers. The Sun Times did not identify underage girl victims unless they had been murdered and it did not name and it did not name rape victims or any age unless they made the brave and harrowing decision to go public. This book does not identify any victim unless the woman specifically spoke to me on the record or her name inescapably became public in court proceedings like Rashana Landfair or in legal filings that she initiated like Tiffany Hawkins. Abden and I had no more success when we rang the bell against the Landfair residence, a quaint two-story cream-colored stucco house with white trimmed windows behind a small patch of lawn from which the last of early December's falling leaves had just been raked. A seven- or eight-year-old station wagon sat in front, parked on the street. When a relative answered the door at the side of the building before we could even introduce ourselves, she's, she barked. Ain't we made it clear we ain't talking to you? But the next day I did connect with Rashana's aunt, her mother's Valerie sister, Stephanie Edwards. For a time, Edward was married to Earl Robinson, who had been a member of public announcement with Kelly. She was a singer herself, and she recorded under the name Sparkle. She was Sparkle to everyone, including family, just like Madonna is always Madonna. The story Abden and I began writing on the second weekend in December 2000 made no mention of Roshana or the second girl whose eighth grade photo I had in a folder on my desk. We were frustrated that we hadn't learned enough to include the information about possible ongoing examples of statutory rape, but we did think we confirmed the central allegation in the facts, Robert's problem, and it's a thing that goes back many years, is young girls. Abden always left the writing to me, reading and then tweaking drafts after we kicked the story back and forth. When we had a final draft, we started the long process of answering queries and approving changes requested by Don Hainer and two other editors on the city desk. Once we cleared those hurdles, the story moved to legal vetting by the paper's outside counsel done and giving its explosive nature final reads by the two executives at the top of the masthead, Michael Cook and publisher John Krukashank. Cook was a boisterous Fleet Street veteran. December 21st, the day before Kelly was set to headline the big Jam Christmas concert sponsored by WGCI FM, the R&B powerhouse of the Midwest. Early on December 20th, I made another call to Kelly spokeswoman, Regina Daniels. The first time we talked, I'd only asked her about Aaliyah and she rambled on. Now I carefully outline all the accusations in our peers seeking comment from the singer. Daniel says she didn't even need to check with him. I have no comment to make. There are a lot of people who are very much a player hater of Robert. All I can go is by the years that I've worked with him and what I've seen. I'm not ha- saying anybody is beyond doing what I do see, but um, I am not looking over the covers with him. All I know is that he presented himself as a professional, respectful person, and that is what I can go by. So it goes on and on and on, and this is a very long chapter here. Um, the fact of this chapter and what is going on with these accusations in the book is that 
he really has no evidence. There's no evidence. These people aren't even really wanting to come forward to talk to him. Let me read the end of this chapter. My colleague's use of t teenage girls bothered me too. Any parent or teacher can attest that there are erroneous differences between 13, 14, and 15-year-old girls and young women of 18 or 19. Abden and I had seen the grammar school photos in high school yearbooks. We met some of the girls and their families and friends. They shown us evidence of how the victims had been hurt, but we'd apparently failed to make some of our own colleagues see what we'd seen, much less convince many of Kelly's fans. Our editors also sent Sun-Times reporter Sabrina Walters to interview members of Kelly, uh, Kelly's audience at the holiday concert. Under the headline, Allegations Don't Faze Fans, she quoted an 18-year-old girl from suburban Bolingbrook who said, her personal life doesn't really concern me. A 29-year-old woman from suburban Glenwood told her, I know Robert, it's not like him. It's a publicity stunt on the girl's part. By the start of the new year, our attempt to reveal a pattern of predation already a decade old seemed to have been dismissed by many and ignored or forgotten by most. So what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on this? Because it's a lot of words. It's a lot of things that, you know, is stated to have happened. And I get that. I get that. I mean, if he went to court in 2008 and was relieved of all charges. Is that something that should be held up in these allegations that are being set forth and people trying to put things together to make it make sense for them just to get a story? Um, these young women, you know, like I said, the reporting of it, they know, they know when something is wrong. And to tell their parents or to tell someone, obviously, either it was not recognized in the culture enough for them to go and to report, or they had no one to report to, or nobody believed them, or whatever the case may be in this particular situation, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I didn't just read what has been recorded. What I'm saying is it did not lead to anything. So is this something that was allowed in the community? Was this something that the parents were okay with just to get their kids established in the musical industry? Um, God rest Aaliyah and may she have peace now, but she is not here to share you know, what happened? She just went away very quietly. I think that what it was, was again about owning the royalties to her music and allowing her to grow on her own label without being under R. Kelly's name. And she did a remarkable job as she moved into her own um, signature. And she made it through. She did. Um, to me personally, I believe that if all of this was as it was supposed to be, why did they keep it quiet? Is that our business to judge him if the family allowed it to be kept in silence? What are your views? So thank you so much for listening to this podcast. We're going to be joined again on tomorrow to finish the solace the case against r kelly by jim dare goddess this was a difficult read so and i've been getting a lot of comments that make a lot of sense to me i mean i'm not i'm still you know feeling that a lot of this was kind of set up where did these young girls even come from how did they connect and i understand he is a public figure but we are going to read more into Solus, okay? Peace and as always, keep it 100.